uh, had mentioned uh, this morning before Sunday school about uh, looking briefly into some of the rock and roll groups. I mentioned, uh, I was talking about Deuteronomy 32 and the vine of Sodom. That in, in that passage used two words, poison and venom. And I remembered that those were rock groups, poison and venom. Uh, there's another one uh, called um, Scorpion, and uh, that's from Revelation 9, the sting of the scorpions, a rock star called Sting, Megadeth, um, Lamb of God, yeah, whatever, yeah. Uh, but just looking at the lyrics of some of these, uh, just those two groups, Poison and Venom, uh, Antichrist all the way. And um, some, of these, some of these groups, um, I remember the guy that um, was with the group called Twisted Sister. Back when Al Gore was a conservative, back in the 80s, when his wife was sort of leading the charge against some of the lyrics and songs and um, the lead singer for uh, Twisted Sister testified before Congress and said basically we're just entertainers we're just you know up there having fun and some of the things we sing about you guys are taking too, too seriously but Twisted Sicker, Sister Sicker Twister Sicker uh, sang songs like we're not going to take it and it was about Teenage Rebellion the video showed this teenage boy throwing his dad out the window or something like that, if I can remember that right. And um, then some of the other groups, it, it was much, much worse. So you have some groups that were just doing it for entertainment value, but you have others that were dead serious about promoting pure Satanism and uh, just evil, evil, evil things. So those are the things that we all came out of. And... You know, sometimes your flesh may want to turn that back on. Don't. Don't. Don't do it. Okay? And I know that feeling. I do. So, uh, but you, God give you a new song to sing. Sing the new songs. Sing the good, good, good gospel songs. All right? Uh, take your Bible. Turn to Genesis chapter 6. And um, this is, I like this kind of study. We're going to study the flood, Noah. And the ark, we're going to study all those things. We're going to kind of look around a little bit. Maybe look at uh, some, some history, some geology, maybe a little. Uh, there is evidence on this earth right now, factual evidence, that it does not take millions of years to lay down rock layers. Doesn't. It doesn't take, and it doesn't take millions of years to make stalactites. Amen. Or as Sterling called them, stick tights. <laughs> right? They stick tight to the ceiling. It doesn't take millions of years to do it. So the things that geologists say, they're not always right. And um, so anyway, Genesis chapter 6, where we're going to start. And uh, let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer first, and then we'll read our scripture text and we'll, we'll move on from there. And uh, this really, teaching like this is really just to, uh, number one, I'd, I like to encourage the young people to, to pay close attention, because a lot of this is for you, because at your age, you're trying to be convinced that the earth is millions and millions of years old, Dinosaurs roamed the earth 65 million years ago. They're, they became extinct way before man ever showed up. And um, that God did not create this world and this universe as a special, unique thing 6,000 years ago. He did not create it in six days. It happened over millions of years. You're at that age where the world is trying to bombard you with that teaching. People like us, we've already rejected it. You know, they're not going to get us with that stuff. But a younger generation 
It's one thing to believe the Bible, but can the Bible be proven? And absolutely, if it's true, then it can be. There's no doubt in my mind about it. So we start with faith, and then we see then the evidence. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask God to give us faith, to teach us how to believe and what to believe, and then we'll ask God to supply the evidence. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for uh, coming to meet with us tonight. We thank you, Lord, for visiting with us in the songs and in this prayer time. We ask you, God, through your Holy Spirit to guide us and lead us in our hearts, especially all the young people, Lord, the ones that are here, the ones that will be watching online. We ask you, God, Lord, to open up their eyes and their ears and their hearts. Father, they may be taught in a public school where the school wants to teach them evolution, teach them they came from monkeys, teach them uh, that they are not God's special creation. Or maybe they're homeschooled or go to a Christian school, but still, friends and influences on television and so on would try to convince them that the Bible's not right and that evolution is fact and that you did not create us, therefore we don't have to obey your laws. And Father, we know that that's from the devil. And so, Father, I ask God that you just give us wisdom tonight. As we go through and study your word, help us, dear God, to believe it in spite of what the world says, in spite of what alleged evidence the world provides, help us, dear God, to believe and know and understand that this Bible is right in everything that it says. Lord, we ask you to increase our faith. We're not asking you, God, to make the Bible in such a way as that we can believe it. We're asking you, God, to change us in such a way as that we will believe what you said in your word. So, Father, Lord, just move in our hearts. Give us knowledge. Give us understanding. Give us discretion, Father. Help us, dear God, to have wisdom based upon that knowledge. Bless your word. Bless us tonight as we hear it. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Genesis chapter 6. Let's pick up reading in verse 5. We're going we're gonna to look at some things pertaining to the flood of Noah. We're not going to get so much into the ark tonight. This is going to be, it's going to take us a while to go through this. There's a lot here to cover. Uh, but what, what, was the, what was the story of the flood all about? Why did God flood the earth? Why did God choose Noah out of all of the people on the earth? Um, what importance does it have for us living today? Is it important that we believe this story. Uh, I said this before, one of the things that I heard when I was in Bible college, taking a course on theology, uh, was you had a lot of these German theologians that didn't quite believe the Bible. One of them was a man by the name of Karl Barth. And Karl Barth came up with this idea that said, it's not important whether Jesus actually was real or not. What's important is that we believe that he was real. Excuse me. If we believe that he was real and then find out that he wasn't, then we're believing a lie. So what, it, I don't want to believe something that's not true. I do, however, want to believe and know the truth because the truth makes us all free. Amen? And so, is it important that there really was a worldwide flood in that the water covered all of the earth, the dry land surface, the water covered all that, or... Was it a localized thing being written by the view of one man who sees nothing but water and says the earth was covered with water? Could it have happened that way? Could it have just been local and in the eyes, I guess, of Moses or somebody that it, it happened worldwide? Anyway, let's look at what God said in his word. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. Here's the reason why God's going to do this. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination, we covered this in Sunday school here a few weeks ago,
that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now here's what the Bible's telling you about the condition of mankind at this, and mind you, at best, we are only from the creation, from the first week of creation until about this time, we're only about, it. the earth and its civilization is only about a thousand years old or just a little bit more than that. A thousand years, and that's it. And in 1,000 years time, the earth, number one, grows in population. Number two, the population, the, the people that are on the earth, grow and increase rapidly in their iniquity. And keep in mind now that um, men like Adam and his son Seth and his son Enos, and you go on down the lineage of, of Adam in Genesis chapter 5, how old were these people living? How old were these men in Genesis 5 living? Over 900 years. Now, uh, the question is, do you believe that these men were really living over 900 years. I do. Why do I believe that? The Bible says it. Now, do I have an explanation for that? Technically, no, I don't. There are theories. There are theories that there was a vapor canopy over the earth that protected man from a lot of the radiation of the sun. We know that the radiation of the sun destroys and damages everything. When you leave something out in the sun over a year or two or three, what happens to it? It just deteriorates it. just tears it down. Okay? does that with everything. So if there was a vapor canopy over the earth shielding the earth from the harmful effects of the sun, then it could be that these people were living to such a long period of time. We do know something very significant here that immediately after the flood, the lifespan of human beings diminish greatly. You have Abraham living 120... Somebody maybe look up how old Abraham was when he died. How much? 175 years. Now, he's not very many generations removed from Noah. Noah... Noah did not live to be over 900 years old. He was 600 years old when the flood began. But after that, after the flood, after he came off the ark and everything like that, his, his life was nearing its end. He did not make it to 800 years, 700 years. He died not too long after that. So we can see that something before the flood was allowing men to live to these great lengths of time, while after the flood, immediately the lifespan goes down. Okay? Now people are, if some people are lucky, they live to be 100 years old. But no one, no one's living to be two, three, four, five, six hundred years old. So it probably had something to do with the condition of the earth before the flood. But, so, but, but do I believe that these people lived over 900 years? Absolutely. That's what the Bible says. Okay. Is it important? I think it is. Can I explain why it's important? Not right now. But I, I think it has to be or it would not be in the Bible. But here's what we know. That with these people living so long, I mean, 900 years worth of thinking can cause you to come up with some pretty terrible things to think about. I mean, you give us five minutes. We can think of some pretty rotten things. Amen? Consider these people living six, seven, eight hundred, nine hundred years. And, and how their minds, without the work of the Holy Ghost in them, how their minds could be corrupted. But we know that the imagination of everybody at that time was only evil, and it says continually. Which means at that point, 
There's no chance that they can be uh, put on probation. There's, they are reprobate. Meaning that God has given them chance after chance after chance and they're not changing. They're not getting better. They're getting to such a state is that they only think evil thoughts and they do it constantly. All the time. And so in verse 6, And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. Now, let me deal with that just very quickly. Does that mean that God is admitting that he made a mistake? No. God did not make a mistake. God knew what he was doing. The idea of the word repent, it has several different meanings in the Bible. One of those, as defined by the Bible, the Bible will say, repent and turn ye. Which means that in some cases, the word repent literally means changing directions. I'm turning. I'm going to do something different now. And that's what is embedded in this concept of the Lord repenting. God did not do anything wrong. God did not commit a sin. God is not saying, ugh. Why didn't I see that coming? I should have never done that. It just simply means that at this point, God now is going to turn. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Think about how your sin affects God. Can you grieve the Holy Spirit of God? Absolutely. With our sin, with our disobedience, with our lack of faith. So verse 7, And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping things and the fowls of the air. Four things here that he's saying. Four things here. I think that's important. I think that points you to the fourth kingdom that's going to come on the earth and how this story is repeated in the last days. Remember Ecclesiastes, there's no new thing under the sun. So he says, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But, but look at verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now this might help you with the question of, in the Old Testament, were they saved by their works? Were they saved by doing what God told them to do? Or were they saved by grace? Clearly, right here, God, we know that later on, God is going to save Noah through this flood, and we know that Noah obeyed God in building an ark. But before God ever approached Noah with the idea of building the ark, clearly God's grace was already upon Noah. Noah, you know what this means? Noah was a sinner. It's what it means. Noah was a sinner. You don't need grace if you have no sins. Amen? You don't need great. You don't need the unmerited favor of God if what you do is constantly abiding in obedience to the Lord. Because then God will just bless you because you're obedient. But when He blesses you, even if you have been disobedient, that's what grace is, and Noah found it. And I like this. I like what this implies here. When you find something, according to the Bible, because you went looking for it. Now think about this. Think about what this means. Let's say that um, let's say that you said something to somebody and you realize right then that you probably shouldn't have said it. And you can tell by their reaction that they were kind of a little upset about it and didn't quite like it, you know. And you know, you go to them and you say, man, I'm sorry. I, 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 shouldn't, I shouldn't have said that. I, that was stupid of me. I do stupid things. Please, please, please forgive me. And when we say that to that person, we're looking in their eyes. Because their eyes are going to tell us whether or not they're going to forgive us. Or they're still steamed over it, and now's not the time to bring it up. And they may never forgive us. You always look in their eyes. The eyes will tell, won't they? The eyes are the window to the heart, to the mind. The eyes will reveal what's inside of a person. 
And when we talk to somebody, even just talking, we're looking at their eyes because we want to see, according to their eyes, how they react to that. When Noah went looking for grace, he found it in the eyes of the Lord. And that, what I think that means is that God's eyes toward Noah was forgiving, was full of mercy, it was full of his grace and his... When we look for love in somebody, we look in their eyes. Because we see it in their eyes. I'll look at my wife and she'll look at me. See? She loved me. She has to. Amen. Okay? But we find grace in people's eyes. All right. So... What was the purpose of the flood? Caleb, what was the purpose of the flood? Why did God flood? Why did God say he's going to destroy every man from off the earth? We'll work on that. Who can answer that? Why did God destroy it? They were sinning. Every thought of their heart was only evil continually. It means they never, never wanted to stop sinning. And God said, I've got to shut this thing down. All right. Now turn to Matthew chapter 24. The importance, Noah's importance and Noah's truth. If the Bible is wrong about Noah and Everything that it says. I mean, the Bible says Noah built this big, huge boat. And that a representative of the species of the animals was going to be on this boat. Some of them in twos, some of them in sevens. A repre now, let me just say this, and I'll probably talk about this later on. Not every little species of dog was on the ark. Chihuahuas and schnauzers and hounds and greyhounds and shih tzus and all of these not every representation of every little breed of dog was on there but you had two dogs and in these two dogs contained the genetic material of every dog that now is on the face of the earth so how many dogs do we need on the ark just two that's all we need because in them Contains all the genetic material. So things like that. So what, was this boat capable of holding all of that? Was it capable of floating? Was the water actually covering the land surface of the entire planet? Was it actually doing that? Is it important that these stories that the Bible tells us are true? Let's read Matthew 24 verse 36. Jesus said, but of that day... And hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Now, there's a word in your Bible that to me is one of the most important words in the whole Bible. Not the most important, but one of them. It's the word as. Because it's used a lot. Somebody go on the pure Bible search and look up how many times the word as is in the King James Bible. Okay? Very important word. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So, here's Jesus. He is... The living word of God. He is the son of God. He is the mighty God. The everlasting father. The prince of peace. And he is saying that he's coming again. And he's saying that his coming is going to be. And the timing of his coming is going to be when the earth is as exactly like as it was in the days of Noah. Now, if the story of Noah is nonsense and it's not true and it's full of lies and, and it's a fable and it's a myth then what does that tell us what hope does that give us concerning Christ and his return 
If God did not save Noah the way the Bible says God saved Noah, then how can we believe that God is going to save us the way the Bible says God's going to save us? How many times, Melissa? 3,520 times exactly. The word as is in the King James Bible. And every one of them is, is important. Because it shows you. God makes comparisons for you in the Bible for our learning. This is as that. He said, as Jonas was in the whale's belly three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. Was Jonas in a whale's belly for three days? Absolutely. Had to be. Because Jesus equated. Why was he going down to the heart of the earth? To set those captives free that were in Abraham's bosom. And to preach to those who were unfaithful before Christ came and show them their judgment. That's why the Bible says he went to preach to spirits in prison, the Bible says. So if Jonah was not in a whale's belly three days and three nights, because science says there is no whale that could contain a man for three days and three nights. Whether there is or isn't, I just know that God prepared one to do exactly that. So I believe it. I have to believe it. As Lot came out of Sodom, Jude talks about that. Um, other stories in the Old Testament that happened, Paul said as these things happen, these things happen for our learning. And if these things are not true, then nothing in the New Testament can be true either. It all has to be true. If you're going to, if you're going to believe the Bible, you've got to accept the whole package. And not just little bits and pieces. So it says, as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days of Noah, that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, and I have this written up on the screen. If the story of Noah, the ark, and the flood are not true, then Christ lied and based his second coming on a myth. Now, is it okay to use a myth or a, let's say, a fable to convey a true spiritual biblical idea? Is it okay to make up a story in order to convey some spiritual truth? No. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. Underline these things in your Bible. If Jesus compared his second coming to as it was in the days of Noah, and according to the Bible, those things are not true, how the Bible has it written, then Jesus based his second coming story on a myth, on a lie, on a fable. And I'm going to show you, we're going to take a trip around the world tonight, and I'm going to show you some of the flood stories from around the earth. Okay? 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables. Let me tell you a story. Who in here knows who J.R.R. Tolkien is? Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit. Okay. J.R.R. Tolkien was a Roman Catholic. And... He believed that the story of Christ, the Son of God, who died on a cross, rose again for man's salvation, he believed that that idea could be told to people by way of mythology. That in mythology, you have gods that died for the benefit or the salvation of other people and they either rose again from the dead or were uh, in some cases awaiting to be 
risen back from the dead. Stories like uh, the story of Apollo or the story of Bacchus or any of these gods who died for the benefit or Quetzalcoatl in Mexico who died for the benefit of others and can be brought back to life. Tolkien believed that he could convey the truth of the gospel by teaching myth. And he had a friend named C.S. Lewis. Who in here has ever read anything from C.S. Lewis? Okay. Lewis was his friend. And so Tolkien goes to Lewis's house and they're smoking pipes and drinking brandy and Tolkien is telling all of these fables. At the time, Lewis doesn't believe in Jesus. Tolkien then goes and tells Lewis all of these fables about these dying gods who saved mankind and so on. These myths, these fables. And then Lewis then becomes a quote-unquote believer in Christ because of that. And Lewis then in turn does the same thing. He writes stories that in his mind convey a truth and yet these stories are not real. They're not true. And so whether it's the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe or the Lord of the Rings, you now have churches that especially when, when these movies came out, you had churches teaching, um, the, trying to preach the gospel based upon... They said that Gandalf, this wizard in the Lord of the Rings, was a picture of Christ because Gandalf was Gandalf the Grey and he went down into a, a, a low place in the earth where there was a lot of fire and he fought this evil monster and it looked like he was dead and then he came back to life and was transformed as Gandalf the White and they said, that's Jesus. And I'm saying, no, Jesus was not a wizard. The Bible specifically says, thou shalt not consult with a wizard. Or follow anybody that does. You cannot teach about Christ and his powers by saying that there's this wizard who had magic powers and he's a picture of Christ. You don't do that. What's wrong with just preaching, thus saith the Lord from the word of God? Nobody wants to do that anymore. So we don't follow cunningly devised fables. When we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He said, I'm telling you the truth. I saw what happened. First Timothy chapter 1 verse 4, neither giving heed to fables and endless genealogies. What does the Mormon church do? They're all about genealogies, aren't they? Dig up your ancestors. They are, they, the Mormon church has the largest repository of genealogies in the world. Why? Because they believe that you can dig up your ancestors, be baptized for them, and they get to go to heaven. Baptism for the dead. Neither give heed to fables. So this is 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 4. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith so do. Godly edifying in faith means that instead of using a fable, I'm going to tell you a story that is true, like Samson, who took the jawbone of an ass and killed, how many Philistines was it? I don't know, hundreds. Okay? Do you believe that story? I sure do. Why? It's in the Bible. It's God's word. God said these things were true. David, who with one toss of a stone from his sling, brought down a man whose stature in feet and inches was, what, 11, 12 feet, something like that, brought him down with one stone in his forehead. Number one, do you believe that there was a man on the earth that was six cubits in a span tall? Number two, do you believe that David brought him down with a stone? David even said, look, this, uh, this Philistine, shoot, I fought a lion and a bear. Grabbed the lion by his beard and pulled his mouth open and pu pulled the lamb right out of there and smote that thing. So I believe these stories. These stories have to, why don't we tell these stories? Why do we have to tell fables and myths? Amen? 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. Turn there. The Bible says, preach the word, not the fable, not the myth, 
not the genealogy, preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. That means deer season, turkey season, squirrel season. Amen. Be ready to preach it. Baseball season. Out of uh, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. This is what's going on right now. We don't want doctrine. We don't want the true things from the Word of God. Even the preachers, they are guilty in this. When they say we don't give them Bible anymore because they won't understand it. So we teach them fables. We teach them myths. We, we draw analogies from movies. There are companies, who, there are companies Brother Ron, that, that will write up um, lessons and sermons for pastors and teachers to preach and teach from that are based on the newest movies that come out. They'll watch the movie. They'll write out how there's some sort of positive imagery in this movie. Write up a sermon about that. And then charge preachers to buy that sermon. Because when they buy the sermon, they get all the nice cool graphics and the rights to display it to go with it. And they put that up on the screen. Me? I just get graphics from Google. I don't care who owns them. But anyway, they, they sell these sermons at a high price. And preachers buy them. Why? Because they don't have to do the work. And then they're preaching about movie stories. And about how that shows God. I've got it the idea that if it's a movie story, they're not preaching the right God. Okay? So anyway, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. And shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto what? Fables. So does Noah's story have to be 100% true? Because if it's not, it's a fable. Now, I will say this. Let me kind of bring this into this. I spent some time this afternoon. I had it in my mind to do this. I was too tired last night. So I spent some time this afternoon looking around the world for flood stories. Because if the Bible is true, that a flood of great proportion happened, surely a story that big has to be found somewhere else in the world. Somebody else in the world knew that it happened. Okay? It was when Noah, after they walked off the ark, and his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, began to have children. They would tell their children about how they spent a year on the ark. And how they had all the animals. And about how Grandpa Noah... God told him to do all this and turned out he was right. And we spent a year on the, And they told their children. Then their children told their children. And then that got passed down to generation after generation. But what happens to a story being told from generation to generation to generation? What happens to a third, fourth, fifth generation? It starts changing a little bit. So what you have all over the earth in every corner of the earth, in every group of people, in every civilization, every tribe, they all have a flood story that is similar to what the Bible says, but not exact to what the Bible says. So let's look at some of them. In the Sumerian uh, civilization, Sumer is the land of Shinar. That's in Genesis chapter 11. The land of Shinar is Sumer. Okay? The Sumerians had a flood story. The Sumerian god Enki, Enkil, I spelled that wrong, gives warning to Atrahasis, or another name for him is Utnapishtim. Anyway, Enki gives warning to this man that a flood is coming to destroy the world and gives him instructions for making a boat. Now this is how the Sumerians told this story. And what we have here is, we have God, or a God, telling a man 
that he's going to destroy the world with a flood and he needs to build a boat. That is exactly what you have in Genesis 6 and 7. Same idea, okay? And the Sumerian civilization was probably, as far as civilizations, were probably closest to Noah in his time, right? So they were about the closest, all right? Then we have the Greeks. Man by the name of Deucalion, or Deus, I don't know how to pronounce this. Deucalion was told by his father Prometheus, Prometheus, who was one of the Greek titans or one of the giants, to build a large chest to escape a great flood. Deucalion and his wife Pyra were saved and the chest landed safely on a mountain after the flood waters went down. Now that's the Greek version of it. So what you have is a god-like character, Prometheus, telling a man to build a large chest and the word ark, that's what it means. The word ark literally means a chest. The ark of the covenant was what? It was a chest. It was a box that held these items. All right? So anyway, how to escape this? So we have, a, we have a God telling a man that a flood's coming and build a chest and he's got his wife involved in it and then after the flood went down, the chest was left on top of a mountain. Same type of story. Okay, that was the Greeks. Even the Irish have a flood story. A book of Irish history called Labor Gabala Erin tells the story of how Ireland came to be inhabited. A woman by the name of Cesare, the daughter of one of the sons of Noah, leads three ships to Ireland to escape the flood. Two of the ships perish, leaving only one man with about 49 women. It got corrupted a little bit as it was told from generation to generation to generation. But some of the elements of this story match what's in your Bible. The Chinese have a flood story. The Chinese Book of History quotes the Emperor Yao describing the Great Flood. These are his words. Like endless boiling water, the flood is pouring forth destruction. Boundless and overwhelming, it overtops hills and mountains. Rising and ever rising, it threatens the very heavens. How the people must be groaning and suffering. Did you see what he said? He said that the waters of this flood covered all the hills and mountains. That is exactly what is told in your King James Bible, that it covered the highest mountain. Also, the story of Nua. What does that sound like to you? A person by the name of Nua, okay? Tells of a Leviathan named Gong Gong. Kind of funny, Gong Gong. You already go into a restaurant and order that sometimes, see what you get. Yeah, I'd like an order of Gong Gong. Tells of a Leviathan type creature named Gong Gong, like a dragon, who, uh, the, I didn't write all this down, but Gong Gong got into a fight with one of the gods of heaven because Gong Gong, the dragon, wanted the throne in heaven. What does that sound like? And so this dragon deliberately banged his head against one of the pillars of heaven. Now, I can tell you, according to the King James Bible, heaven is held up by pillars. According to the Bible. Okay? I have the verse in my notes that the pillars of heaven shake. That's what the Bible says. Causing a portion of the heavens to fall, which cracked the earth open, causing waters to pour forth on the earth. Now, according to the Bible, the waters fell down from the heavens, opened up, the earth also opened up and poured forth water. Wow. The heroine Nua, she, Nua is a woman, repairs the heavens with the legs of a turtle used as pillars to hold the heavens back in place. Okay? That's the Chinese version of it. 
Here is from India, the Indian legend of Manu and Matsya. Matsya, who is the incarnation of the Lord Vishnu as a fish, forewarns Manu, who is a human, a man, about an impending catastrophic flood and orders him to collect all the grains of the world in a boat. Now, I can tell you this. Think of grain. The purpose of the ark stated in Genesis chapter 7 was for God to preserve seed. It's exactly what he said. So to collect all the grains of the world in a boat, in some forms of the story, all living creatures are also to be preserved in the boat. When the flood destroys the world, Manu, in some versions, accompanied by the seven great sages. Now, how many people were on the ark? Eight. Manu with these seven sages. So it would be Noah and seven, yeah, Noah, his wife, his three sons and their wives. There's eight people, okay? Survives by boarding the ark, which Matsya pulls to safety. So here, you have seed preserved, you have a boat, you have a catastrophic flood, and you have eight people on this ark, just like the Bible says. Let's go back to one of the most famous stories of the ark called the Epic of Gilgamesh. This is a Sumerian. There, there are 12 clay tablets that have survived history. They're from Sumeria, which again is Shinar in Genesis 11. Tablet number 11 gives many details surrounding Utnapishtim, who is their version of Noah, and his survival of a great flood. His boat full of animals. The boat resting on a mountaintop and Utnapishtim sacrificing to the gods afterward. What did Noah do when he came off the ark? He built an altar and he sacrificed some of the animals to God after the flood. A little bit corrupted, but it's some of the same ideas. Here's my favorite one out of all. And I, th there, there were too many to put up here tonight. But here's my favorite one. The Hawaiian version of this actually has a man by the name of Nu'u. That's Noah. Who was a man who built an ark with which he escaped a great flood. He landed his vessel on top of Mauna Kea, which is a great mountain on the big island. Nu'u mistakenly attributed his safety to the moon and made sacrifices to it. So there's the sacrifice. Cana, the creator God, descended to earth on a rainbow and explained Nu's mistake. What do you have? You have Noah building an ark, escaping a flood. His vessel lands on top of a mountain. He makes sacrifices after the flood, and you have a rainbow. It's my favorite story. Okay? I would love to go to the Hawaiian Islands and try to preach this and say, no, here's the real version of it. That rainbow is not Kene, the creator God. I don't know how to pronounce that. Kene, his name is Jesus. Now, look up on the screen. These and countless other stories, myths, and oral traditions are the fossilized remains of the truth of the word of God. You have a picture of a fossil up there. We can sort of tell by the skeletal structure of this particular fossilized creature what it looked like, right? I mean, we have the essences of what this creature is that's fossilized, but we don't have the whole animal preserved. The hair is gone, the skin is gone, the organs are gone, but we have the skeletal remains. All of these stories, whether it's Nu'u, or Gilgamesh, or Manu, or any of these other stories, they're all the skeletal remains. They're the fossils of the story of Noah. Now, there is only one place where you don't have the fossil, you have the whole story. King James Bible, Word of God, tells you the whole and the complete story of the flood. So, a couple things here to, to gather from tonight. 
Number one, the story of Noah must be 100% correct as recorded for us in our Bibles. If it is not, Jesus is a liar. And that means that he's not God. Because God is not a man that he should lie. Amen? Number two, if the story of the flood is true according to the Bible, there should be and is evidence. Now, we may look at, as we move along here, we may look at some of the geological evidence. What would you expect to find if there were billions of animals all over the world that died and were buried in the mud? What would you expect to find a thousand years later? Billions of dead things laying in layers all over the earth. And that's exactly what you have. These things were not laid down over millions of years. They were laid down and fossilized in a, in a, probably in a matter of days because of the great pressure of the water on top of the dirt and the mud. So that's what you would expect to find. But you would also expect to find stories all over the earth and most of these stories have the fossilized remains of the truth of the Word of God. Meaning that even though the story is corrupted a little bit, they still tell of a great flood and how the gods were angry with people and how one of the gods saved one of the men and a bunch of the animals on a boat and the boat sat on a mountain. You have the same thing, same idea. Okay. Now, here's what's really neat to me. All of these stories from all over the world, they all got corrupted. How come this one didn't? Because it's the Word of God and God preserved it. Amen? I'm just going to read this last part of the verse here. And we're going to use this then as the starting point of what we're going to talk about next week. Here's what God was interested in doing. Genesis chapter 6 verse 9. Turn your Bibles there. And then we're going to end with this. These are the generations of Noah. This is Genesis chapter 6 verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his what? Generations. The word gene. Is in the word generations. Genetics. You and I, Sterling, myself, all you guys, all you ladies, all you ladies, all you guys, red, yellow, black, and white, we were precious in his sight. Every one of us is a descendant from Noah and only Noah. Why do I say only Noah? Because no one else aside from Noah and his sons, survived that flood. All of us in this room are descendants of Noah through either Shem, Ham, Japheth, or a combination of them. Okay? All of us are the recipients of his genetics. The Bible says that Noah was perfect in his generations. What does that mean? We're going to explore that. And Noah walked with God. Noah begat three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. And notice this, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. There was a corruption of flesh that took place. What was that? Verse 13, And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Now, back in verse 9, Noah was perfect in his generations. I believe that that is saying that Noah's DNA was exactly the way God intended it to be. He was a direct descendant from Adam, and Noah carried in him the genetics of both Adam all the way down to him, and Noah's genetics, Noah's genes, Noah's DNA had not been corrupted. All of the others had been. 
Was God interested in preserving Noah's genetics and his DNA? Yes. And I can sh I'll show you that from the Bible next week. Okay? I also, I've got, well, I won't get into it. I won't let you go. I have evidence that the devil is trying to cover that up. You showed it to me. I think it was you. Where it says Noah was perfect in his generations. Didn't you send me a text on that? Look, look through your message. I think it was you. Maybe it wasn't. But I have evidence that the devil is trying to cover that up. Okay? I'll show it to you next Sunday. You have to be here. All right? Let's stand to our feet. J.R., did a flood cover the entire earth? Did it cover all the highest mountains? Callie, do you believe that all of the animals were on the ark? What about dinosaurs? You don't know? Caleb? You believe that Jesus' coming, his second coming, is going to be as it was in the days of Noah? Okay. Don't forget it, guys. Very important. Very important to you. All you young people watching, it's very important to you. Okay? This Bible has to be right, or we're doomed. Okay? Heavenly Father, come before you tonight. I thank you, God, for lessons like this. Thank you, God, that this Bible... It's not, not just a, a record of fables and myths and legends and nonsense. That its words, its very words, are true and they're right. And when the Bible speaks of history and science and genetics, and all of these issues, the Bible is right in everything that it talks about. And Father, we accept it by faith. But Lord... Show us the evidence that is in this world. Show us, Lord, that it's right and it's true, Lord. Increase our faith. Help our faith. And teach us, dear God, just how important this story is. Is it just history? Can we just forget about it and move on? Or is it important for us living in the last days? So, Father, show us these things and teach us how to live according to these things that we learn in your word. Honor your word and magnify your word in our hearts, in these young people's hearts, Father, so that as they grow and mature, these things never depart from them, but they're always locked into their hearts till the day they meet you in heaven. Lord, just bless your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you.